In this tutorial, we'll look at limestone, the first aim being to describe the uses of limestone, then evaluate the pros and cons of quarrying limestone, that means extracting it from rock surfaces, and then finally look at how we can chemically change and treat limestone in what we call the limestone cycle reactions. I think the most interesting fact about limestone is where it comes from. It comes from shellfish. So these living animals at some stage in their life take in carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide is dissolved in the oceans. And they turn that carbon dioxide into calcium carbonate, which is the main chemical making up their shells. As they die, their shells get crushed and compressed and form limestone. The appearance of limestone can vary quite dramatically. Generally, it's an off-white rock, but hopefully this picture demonstrates how an off-white rock can also be quite beautiful. So why do we have a whole lesson devoted to limestone? Well, the fact is limestone is incredibly useful. In fact, I bet you're not aware of how many things you actually put limestone into. Limestone is found in toothpaste. It's an ingredient in bread. It's an ingredient in paint. Limestone is soft and easy to sculpt, so you can make some fantastic sculptures using limestone. From an evolutionary point of view, limestone is very interesting because it has the ability to preserve once living organisms to form fossils. But without any questionable doubt, the reason why limestone is so valuable to us is how we use it in construction. If you heat limestone with powdered clay, it forms cement, the stone glue that holds bricks together. If you mix limestone with sand, water and gravel, you make concrete, one of the strongest building materials we have. And surprisingly, if you mix sand and sodium carbonate with limestone, you can make glass. So I hope you appreciate how valuable limestone is to us. I will go into this in more detail later on, but basically, calcium carbonate, which is the main chemical in limestone, CaCO3, can be treated to produce other chemicals such as calcium oxide, CaO, and calcium hydroxide, CaOH. Don't let this little bracket thing uh, trouble you. There is a good reason why it's there, but you won't learn about it until you look at ionic compounds. So both calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide have their uses. Traditionally, calcium oxide was used as stage lighting. They used to heat it up until it glowed so brightly that you could actually light a stage. That's where the expression, don't steal the limelight, comes from, because literally, the light was made from limestone. You may have heard of lime water before. Well, that is basically dissolved calcium hydroxide. Lime water we use in plenty of chemical tests to test for the presence of carbon dioxide. When lime water detects carbon dioxide, it turns cloudy. Both calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide are tremendously useful when dealing with acidic soils. Soils with a low pH, acidic meaning pH 1 to 6, are not particularly great at helping plants grow. So we can use powdered calcium oxide or dissolved liquid calcium hydroxide to neutralize acidic soils and help increase crop yield, or in other words, how many crops grow. And that's how we describe the uses of limestone. So now let's evaluate limestone quarrying. A quarry is basically a dig site where we extract limestone. And there's some very obvious um, disadvantages to having a quarry and also some benefits. There's a bit to remember, so I just basically drew a picture to help you recall some of these arguments. So firstly, the benefits, well, we've already seen how limestone has many uses, so you could list a few. Remember, this is a popular six marker, so do commit these arguments to memory. Um, limestone is very sought after, so therefore people will pay for it, so it brings money into the economy. That money can be used to make local improvements to the town's infrastructure and facilities, therefore raising the quality of life for the people who live there. Also, it's very common practice that restoration, in other words, returning this site back to normal, is required as part of the planning permission. So even though it can be quite a nuisance whilst there, you can sort of assume that when they're done, they'll clear up and return it back to its normal state. So that all sounds great, so where's the problem? Well, I've tried to make this image as visually noisy as possible. Firstly, to extract the limestone, we need to use explosives, and obviously that creates a lot of dust and a lot of noise. So we get noise and air pollution from explosions. There's also obviously a lot of noise from diggers which also extract limestone. The limestone will need to be transported. So this will increase traffic, noise and also air pollution in the local area as more lorries drive to and from the site. 
Obviously, a big hole in the ground is going to destroy natural habitat. It looks ugly, it's an eyesore, and, and obviously it destroys natural habitat where animals live. These arguments would certainly be enough to give you six marks if you had to answer a question which looks at the pros and cons of limestone quarrying. So now we can evaluate the pros and cons of quarrying limestone. So now we're going to look at the calcium carbonate cycle, or the limestone cycle. What's important to understand here is how we treat calcium carbonate and the various other products that are made, and also explain what happens to them. What you will not need to learn in this specific topic is why we write chemical formula like this, why stick a 3 there, why put brackets here, small 2 there, and so on. I know this can be a little bit disorientating, but don't worry about it. You will understand that in another lesson. For now, chemistry is really just an exercise in memory. So I've already shown you how other products made from limestone are useful. In other words, calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide. But what do we do to turn calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide? And how can we return that back to calcium carbonate? That's what the limestone cycle is all about. So the first thing we do is heat calcium carbonate very strongly. This brings about a chemical reaction known as thermal decomposition. That is breaking down something, decomposition, with heat, thermal. When you put bread into a toaster, the heat breaks down the sugars. So the sugars are being thermally decomposed. That's what creates the black sort of carbon you get on your toast. So when any metal carbonate, such as calcium carbonate, remember calcium is a metal, um, is heated strongly, it will release carbon dioxide to produce calcium oxide. So I'm going to show you how to do this here practically. So what I've got is some limestone here and some tongs, and I'm just heating it strongly using um, a Bunsen burner. It will start to glow very white. It takes some time, but the carbon dioxide will be given off and are producing calcium oxide. So now we have calcium oxide, which can be used, as I said, in powdered form to neutralize acidic soils. And if I put a little bit of water in there, I produce something called slaked lime. Calcium oxide is commonly known as quick lime. And if we put a little bit of water on the hot calcium oxide, it literally slurps it up. This produces slaked lime or calcium hydroxide. So you can see that in this video footage. You can even hear the hot calcium oxide absorb that water to produce calcium hydroxide if you listen and watch. Chris, a little bit. Okay. So now we have slaked lime. And if we keep on pouring water into it, we make lime water, which is also a calcium hydroxide solution. It's chemically the same, we've just dissolved it completely. So watch. So I'm just adding more water and it's going to dissolve completely. So the question is now, how do I turn it back into calcium carbonate, that lump of limestone I started off with? Well, if you're expecting a lump of limestone, you're not going to get it, but you will get calcium carbonate back. All you need to do is add the carbon dioxide we originally removed through thermal decomposition. The easiest way to add carbon dioxide back in is to blow into it because we breathe out carbon dioxide. So you can see that happening here, and you can see that it turns cloudy. The cloudiness is just little flecks of calcium carbonate, little solid particles of calcium carbonate. That's what makes it cloudy, because they're not soluble, they're in insoluble. We call this a precipitate reaction when a solid comes out of a solution. So, just to review, remember, we take calcium carbonate, that's where we start off, CaCO3. We heat it strongly. This brings about a thermal decomposition reaction. In this reaction, carbon dioxide is given off. Now, if you think about it, if you take away one carbon and two oxygens, you're left with one calcium and one oxygen. That's calcium oxide, or CaO. Calcium oxide is also known as quicklime. Now, we add in water. Now, remember, we had CaO, and now we're adding two H's and an O. Well, the two here applies to both of these elements inside the bracket. So we have two H's and two O's. One O comes from the water and the other O comes from calcium oxide. So again, you can see how it all balances up. Now we're just adding more water, so there's no change in the chemical composition. Finally, we blow carbon dioxide back into lime water to produce calcium carbonate. So in this solution, we have calcium carbonate and water. So Ca and one O plus CO2 
will give you CaCO3. Okay, that's simple because we're just adding this here to make that. And now we're adding this and this together to make that over here. And then what's left over are two hydrogens and an oxygen, in other words, water. Just remember the key stages and the fact that carbon dioxide is given off and needs to come back in to produce calcium carbonate. One exam question they ask you is, why does the mass of calcium carbonate change as you heat it? And that's because it gives off carbon dioxide, so it loses a gas. Because gases are invisible, people are quite easy to uh, discount it as something that weighs anything. But of course it does, it's made from matter. Another chemical reaction worth knowing related to limestone is that with acid rain or sulfuric acid. You see, although limestone is insoluble in water, it doesn't dissolve. With a weak acid, it can corrode very, very easily. And that's summarized by this word equation here and this chemical equation here. So calcium carbonate plus sulfuric acid will give you calcium sulfate. That's because the calcium carbonate is reacting with sulfuric acid plus water plus carbon dioxide. Don't bother trying to worry how this happens or anything like that. Some things in chemistry you just need to learn. You need to know this specific word equation. So you can see how it's summarized chemically, CaCO3 plus H2SO4 will produce CaSO4 plus H2O water and CO2 carbon dioxide. Generally anything which is an acid will start with a hydrogen because acids chuck out hydrogen, that's what makes them acidic. More specifically hydrogen ions. Now I've seen this as a six mark as well, where you have to explain how you would investigate the rate at which metal carbonates decompose when heated, or rather different metal carbonates. Now remember, calcium carbonate is just one metal carbonate, but in a school lab you could quite easily use copper carbonate, zinc carbonate, magnesium carbonate, and sodium carbonate. Some will thermally decompose faster than others. In other words, they will break down and release carbon dioxide at a faster rate than others. How could we experimentally test this? Well, firstly, just look at these word equations. So we have copper carbonate rather than calcium carbonate producing copper oxide rather than calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. CuCO3 produces CuO plus CO2. Remember not to write an equals here. It is a one-way arrow saying because it's saying this is produced. It's not saying this is equal to that. Now, zinc carbonate, well, that will break down thermally decompose into zinc oxide and CO2. Look how easy this is. We're just taking the metal, the chemical symbol of the metal, and replacing it. That's all you need to do. So how do we test this experimentally? Firstly, you'll need two or more different metal carbonates. Here I've got copper and zinc carbonate. Then you'll need a test tube with a sidearm delivery tube, which is going into another test tube filled with lime water. You will also need a Bunsen burner on standby to heat the carbonate in the test tube. Remember, it's really important that you always use the same mass of carbonate to make it a fair test. So let's see if you understand what's going on here. So, firstly, as I've said, you start off with two separate metal carbonates. So I've got zinc and copper. Now I've got copper in there first, I've weighed it out and I'm heating it strongly. You'll see it starts to change black. That indicates a chemical reaction is taking place. It's also going to be giving off carbon dioxide here. Now that carbon dioxide is released into the delivery tube. Now as it's being released, I'm timing it. And you can see it's starting to turn the lime water cloudy. When it becomes cloudy, I stop the timer. I can now repeat this with a different carbonate, same mass of a different carbonate, and time how long it takes for the lime water to turn cloudy. Then you compare the time to see which one decomposed the fastest. One small point to add to all this, it could be with a specific metal carbonate, you heat it and heat it and heat it and you're getting nothing over here. That's because some carbonates require very high temperatures before they start decomposing, much higher than a Bunsen burner can provide. So that is how you explain the limestone cycle reactions.